Now, I've been asked to make discussant comments, but I'll keep them really, really brief. Um, but I, I can't, I can't not start without thanking Rada Ivekovic because she's probably the only person who could bring such an amazing group of people together. People whose words and deeds have inspired me and I suspect many people here over many decades. They continue to inspire me today and we all know why after listening to the, to the speakers. Um, and I also wanna thank the two most progressive institutions of for, formal higher education in the post-Yugoslav, or some of us would still hope almost Yugoslav space, uh, Centre for Advanced Studies in Rijeka and Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. You are beacons of hope in this, and thank you, thank you for that. So look, we are here because it's the politics of translation. Translations are assemblages of the aspects of the various aspects of people's lives, their lives, their conditions of existence and their social relationships are reassembled through processes of translation. And bringing power in was what the, the speakers did brilliantly. Translation is firmly in the realm of the relational and the ethical. Um, it's not just linguistic, but it is linguistic. It's not just about meaning, but it is about the, materia the materiality the multidimensionality or intersectionality of oppression and the pluriversal. And I wanna channel Adam Gatachov's uh, work because when we do translation in this forum, we have the possibility of envisaging forms of counter hegemonic and anti-systemic world making. We remember them, we try to critically interrogate them and we actually think about how they could form a vision in, in the future. So humbly and with, with a degree of trepidation, I just want to ask one thing or tease out one thought for each of the speakers. Um, and I also think it's very much about bodies. Radi Vekovic wrote a while ago that the limits of translation are inscribed on the body. And I think with Bo Ventura's paper, we had you know, bodies in movement and bodies in struggle and bodies of knowledge. And this idea of intercultural and interpolitical translation was extraordinarily important. And this derivation of principles from, from deep work with social movements seems to me to be incredibly important. But I want to, and it may be trivial this point, but I want to pick up what I thought I heard, Boa, on messiness. I think messiness is a really good thing, actually. Of course, you can't leave messiness as messiness, but tidying up messiness is actually not necessarily the way to go. And I, I wonder if you see, like I do, the connections between that moment of optimism when everything was possible in the first phase of the World Social Forum with the moment of optimism of decolonization, you know? And in a sense, it, it must have been known that it would be more complicated, that the moment of optimism, the moment of hope also will be fragmented and messy and that we need to critically interrogate that. So I just, I almost want with you to rescue messiness. Etienne, there's no reason why you will have heard of an English singer called Billy Bragg, uh, but whenever I listen to you and the profound anti-racist work that you've done, Billy Bragg has a line in one of his songs, what do they know of England who only England know? And whenever I listen to you, it's what do they know of Europe who only Europe know, right? So this whole idea of, you know, Europe learning from Africa, Europe is made by and in the process of the global South, right? Europe is not a prior uh, site of knowledge. Um, and of course, rather will not forgive me, but would expect it, if we do bring Yugoslavia into this story, we can also do it through Yugoslavia's involvement in the non-aligned movement, you know, in terms of a different relationship between somewhere in Europe and decolonial global south. And, and we can, you know, for all its contradictions, we can still think through that. But my question for you is on federations, all right? I thought this was beautiful about the kind of messiness of federations. But how can we think, do you think we, is it possible to think of federations 
in a detorial, deterritorialized way. Because actually federations are only, you know, the sons and daughters of colonialism, right? And even linguistic communities are deterritorialized de connections across colonial violence. So can we think about federations which are not territorialized? That would be, that would be my question. Francoise, I've been reading uh, a decolonial feminism and I'm inspired by so much of it, the, the critique of civilizational feminism, the, the wonderful way in which you make the kind of cha chains of equivalence between different kinds of erased bodies, bodies allowed to die, bodies that are forced to die. And it does seem to me that the rescuing of protection is almost so impossible to, en to envisage that I'm with you, we actually have to try and do it. And it kind of goes in a circuit of protection, security and rights have become so, what's the right word, so kind of colonialized, so uh, radically distorted by hegemony and, and patriarchy and colonialism and capitalism. But where, where are we going with this? Because exhaustion, right? Exhaustion, I guess the opposite is replenishment and replenishment is a kind of relation of caring you know, so some of that feminist literature on care, it's one of those words coming from Liverpool I can't pronounce properly, so forgive me, but, but can we think of a politics, no, a, a reconnection of protection that is actually about mutual care? Um, but where does the self come in here? Because I'm, um, Michelle Callon's voice is in my head about the moment we speak on behalf of others, we silence them. The moment anyone protects anybody else, what does that do to the protectee, in a sense? So I would love you to kind of uh, think a little bit more on, on that. So I really did try and take only six minutes and I don't want the, I don't want the, the speakers to respond immediately because that would give me a privileged status that I don't want. What I think we should try and do is have at least two rounds of gathering questions and comments. Uh, the first round and then we'll let the speakers respond. And then if we've got time, we'll do a second round. Uh, is that all right with people? Okay. And so the usual rules apply. Either raise your hand using the, using the, the function of reactions or write something in, in the chat. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I have not uh, formulated the, my possible questions uh, in my head. Uh, uh, I was surprised like everyone now, uh, if you have a question. But uh, I have several, uh, I, I've, I find that we had three fabulous uh, uh, papers. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to read. Uh, uh, longer versions, um, but um, about uh, one little thing in, in each uh, presenter, uh, about the fact that uh, all uh, cultures are incomplete, Boa. Uh, <clears throat> we can only agree with that. Uh, but surely if they are all incomplete, then uh, None is incomplete because, as you say, you, you, you should <laughs> uh, bring to the end your, your th uh, thought and your sentence. You usually say that they are reciprocally incomplete. Because if they are only incomplete, uh, that uh, uh, makes them individual cases. And it doesn't work very well in the di direction we are uh, interested uh, in. Um, you are right in, in uh, insisting that the most difficult part is nation and nationality, human rights and rights of nature, uh, democracy and spirituality, why not spirituality, uh, which we have lost in the 17th century, uh, as you say, said, 
but uh, actually, for example, in Indian culture that I uh, know a little better than other uh, uh, outer European uh, cultures, spirituality uh, comes uh, in the same language in which uh, uh, comes uh, what would be uh, po political language, what we have in politics uh, today. And uh, of course, they have this uh, uh, Western uh, uh, influence of uh, the idea of the uh, political. Uh, my surprise is always when uh, philosophers deal with Indian uh, philosophy that they uh, uh, always say this is not political. Uh, and they don't see the uh, 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 parenthood <laughs> of the political and the spiritual. Uh, I'm sure this happens also in other cultures, but I won't go into details. I would like uh, you to, to tell me your thought. If I may uh, uh, go quickly uh, to uh, what uh, uh, Etienne said uh, about uh, all sorts of things that we must discuss a little more, but uh, uh, when several languages are used and overlap, overlap, uh, Etienne, uh, we have had an exchange on this already, but uh, the, the definition of several languages uh, is problematic. Uh, so what intervenes here is the naming of languages, right? It is a name or a name, and we have a whole, uh, uh, what do you call it, diapason of uh, language forms that are not only two, but we have these two extreme ones in, in, in Ukraine and in Serbian and Croatian. Uh, but in between, there are all uh, intermediary forms. Uh, and uh, politically, there is no, uh, politically for us, but for the state, it's different. Uh, there is no difference between uh, uh, languages and, and uh, dialogues or Id idioms and, and, and vernaculars. Uh, but this, uh, I have come to believe that uh, this idea of naming a language is very different and uh, very important. And then Dubravka Ugrasic told me that the difference between, uh, and I believe her because <laughs> she knows what she's talking about, the difference between uh, a Ukrainian and Russian is smaller than the difference between extreme forms of uh, Croatian and Serbian, which we still consider as one language. Uh, and yes, we should denationalize languages, but that I will have in my uh, in my talk. Uh, if you can uh, say something about uh, these problems I have with languages, Françoise, I agree with everything you said, um, and uh, I find especially interesting the idea of. Uh, the economy of uh, exhaustion, which is inseparable from uh, capitalism and the fact that uh, uh, the colonial history of protection should be studied, bringing us to uh, uh, forms of care uh, that need to uh, uh, take into account the, 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 the gap which was formed uh, uh, theoretically between production and reproduction. That gap doesn't work anymore since we've had uh, this uh, feminist uh, uh, critique uh, that you mentioned and that uh, uh, Veronica will talk about, uh, which, is, uh, which is important. Uh, and Paul, the question of the messiness of federations but sure, and that me, me, uh, federations come from colonialism. Uh, and the, the question is whether we can deteriorize, deterritorialize federations. Is the same question as uh, can we deterior, deterritorialize languages? And uh, this is what uh, we are trying to do in uh, post Yugoslav countries. Some of us are trying to de territorialized uh, uh, languages. And actually, they have never been completely territorialized, right? 
it's it's a usurpation, uh, a power usurpation uh, from the state and institutions and academies that does it. I'm sorry, these were not really questions and that was probably too long. Thank you. Oh, neither, neither. Well, I don't know whether they were questions, but they were great interventions. And I still would like to see if there's one more person that wants to say something in this first round before I give the three speakers the chance to reflect on, on what they've heard. Yes, uh, thank you very much to all the speakers for your very inspiring uh, presentations. I, I had several light bulbs uh, go on in my head and I, I, you presented a lot of puzzle pieces that I now uh, am very looking forward to work with. So thank you very much. Um, I agree with everything, surprisingly, maybe. <laughs> I just uh, stumbled upon the notion of um, monoculture in a sense that all of us are parts of monocultures because of my own experience um, with my family having fled from Yugoslavia to Austria when I live um, for 30 years. So I've spent a lot of translating with, between uh, different aspects. So I, I, I come from monoculture in some aspects, but also I, I think I, uh, I also embody um, interculture in, on the one hand, but I also I'm also a researcher in peace and conflict studies, and uh, but I also have this lived experience of war, and uh, especially now during the Ukraine war, I, I found it very challenging to um, translate between these experiences and also to try to communicate to people who just experience war from a theoretical perspective <laughs> um, how different the experiences are and uh, and also uh, it is very challenging but it's also very um, at times violent experience so I don't want to romanticize this uh, um, role of translating which is often done with marginalized people who are forced to live between or in different cultures but I also think it's important to stress that um, in many different aspects we embody interculturality in our experience, but I also think that it is often marginalized who, who do a lot of work of translating, which is not recognized. So maybe you could uh, expand on this notion. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so what I propose to do is give the three speakers a few minutes to reflect and respond on what they've heard from each other and from the three of us who intervened. And Francoise, if you don't mind, can I start with you? Do you want to? Do you want to <laughs> no? Okay. So, uh, who wants to go first then? Etienne, Boa? Boa, go ahead. You like? Okay. Uh, okay, this yeah. time you'll have to cut me <laughs> severely <laughs> because you raised uh, so many uh, important issues. Uh, in a sense, uh, Rada, I'm delighted with that. Of course, she already started to give an answer, which is not my answer, but that's a uh, uh, suggestion to uh, one of your questions about uh, uh, federations. The, the point with which, which I would uh, like to argue with uh, Rada is the absolute, uh, seemingly universal uh, uh, axiom, federations always come from colonialism, you said, if I'm not uh, uh, mistaken, which seems to me to be a, a, a little... Uh, perhaps uh, abuse it, but uh, we, we can come back to that. Uh, uh, allow me, uh, just in a few minutes, I, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with, uh, uh, with the uh, question of uh, um, uh, non-territorial federalism and return to it through a remark on, uh, on, on languages and, and, and their status. So, um, uh, of course, my, my inspiration trying to go into that direction, I mean, which I uh, believe is a political imperative in, uh, in, imperative in, in such situations as the Ukrainian, uh, Russian, uh, European situation, if we try and imagine an optimistic uh, scenario, and in fact, I'm not, of, of course, optimistic, huh? But uh, 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 it, of course, uh, uh, revolves uh, around the idea that uh, we should try and avoid by uh, uh, any means a 
pseudo or catastrophic uh, uh, solution in which uh, uh, all Russian speakers, uh, Russophones, so Russophones, if you're using the French uh, uh, are uh, uh, displaced to the Russian Federation, I mean, the Russian uh, uh, territory, and they remain uh, uh, in Ukraine. Only uh, uh, people uh, who uh, uh, declare, that's the question of the name, of course, Ukrainian to be their uh, maternal uh, language or people who accept to re-educate uh, uh, themselves as quickly as possible for Ukrainian or, or something called Ukrainian to, 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 to be their uh, uh, official language. That would be a repetition, uh, another repetition, uh, and I, I fear it can take place, but a repetition of the uh, uh, horrific processes that took place everywhere in the world, but particularly in, uh, in, in Europe during the 20th century, and, and particularly at the end of the Second World War, uh, to which we were all forced to return these days to try and find some uh, uh, clues to the current situation, where uh, hundreds of thousands and, and even millions of uh, uh, would be uh, uh, pushed from east to west and, 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 and west to east, deported uh, in, in, in fact, to have the political borders of the post-war uh, Europe coincide with a completely arbitrary, of course, definition of the territorial uh, 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 limits. Now, Austro-Marxism is not the uh, uh, perfect solution, but the more I think about it, the more I, uh, uh, I think that uh, we have to find uh, uh, interesting suggestions there. And I ask uh, you, uh, uh, Sasha, Sanya, Rada, etc., for another uh, uh, seminar, uh, whether uh, this uh, played a role or not in inspiring the uh, architects, I would say, of uh, Yugoslav uh, federalism. Uh, but uh, 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 even I tend to believe today that Lenin, uh, the great uh, uh, scapegoat, I mean, the culprit uh, in, in Putin's discourse, for the current situation, because he would have invented that uh, non-existent entity, Ukrainian nation, and made it a, a, a federal republic part of the uh, uh, Soviet Union. So when you return to the debate through Marshal Lewin, etc., you find incredible, uh, an incredible moment of conflict between Stalin and Lenin in 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 in, in 2022, uh, where uh, 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 Stalin uh, 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 writes to some of his uh, uh, colleagues, this Lenin is a liberal. Uh, he's a, he remains a liberal. We must be very tough against him. He writes to the uh, uh, to 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 his colleagues. So some sort of Austro-Marxism is still there, perhaps uh, uh, looming in the in the in the margins. The great idea, of course, of also Austro-Marxism, which is also problematic. Uh, being the f very problematic in a sense, it's communitarianism in the sense in which the, the French Republic hates it. Huh? It's the idea that uh, 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 individuals uh, 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 name themselves or, 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 or declare themselves as uh, 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 belonging to a certain community or, or, or tradition, not because they live in this uh, part of the country or that part of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the country, but because they have inherited and been and, and been educated in a certain tradition, which is, of course, not incompatible with multiple uh, uh, belonging. Uh, now, leave the USSR and, uh, and uh, because I don't have time. And now one quick remark about the languages of Europe. I believe that's one of the keys. If we turn to the practical side of the problem. Uh, I'm always uh, uh, surp surprised and shocked, I have to say, by the fact that uh, wherever you go to, to find a list of names, uh, of names of the so-called languages of Europe, go to Wikipedia or to any other, uh, uh, etc. cetera, uh, you find a very long list of official national languages and then subordinated minor languages. That's the hierarchy of dialects and languages that Rada was uh, alluding to. So you find a whole hierarchy. Huh? And then there are some huge fundamental linguistic practices totally missing. You'll never find any such uh, a list in which 
it is uh, 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 explained that Arabic is one of the languages of Europe. Uh, and you'll find this extraordinary formula. Maltese is the only European languages belonging to the Semitic family. Give me a break. I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a, so the question becomes, the question becomes, what kind of constitutional uh, or perhaps uh, 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 um, uh, extra constitutional, I mean, cracked institutional, uh, arrangement to find uh, at the European level. You're not solve that problem for France separately and then for uh, Germany. Incidentally, it's also explained that Turkish is spoken in some small remote parts of, 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 uh, of Europe, but of course not by millions in, Ger in, Ger in, Ger in Germany. Uh, so how to, which kind of institutional arrangement to, 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 to find for these extra European language spoken by millions of European uh, uh, in, 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 in inhabitants, uh, citizens from my uh, uh, point of view, uh, et cetera, to, to, to receive progressively recognition, if possible, at the level of equality with other uh, 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 local languages. And allow me, I've been too long, but to finish with a, 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 a personal note or memory, huh? I will draw an example from the country, which is, of course, the arch uh, villain in all our discussions about imperialism. It's, uh, that's the United States of America. Uh, 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 the, the USA are officially a federation. Uh, that means, of course, that uh, every local state retains uh, uh, certain important uh, uh, powers. See these days on a uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, game between the central Supreme Court and the local governments to restrict the, 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 the rights of, uh, of women and, uh, and develop the war on women and so on and so on. So that federation is a state. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, and and, and it's, it's monolingual officially, although it's only recently that uh, 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 several states in, in the United States, as a racist, of course, an anti-immigrant uh, uh, move, have inscribed in their constitution that English is the uh, language. But when I came to California uh, 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 30 years ago or I, uh, something like that, to, to, to start uh, teaching more or less regularly, uh, I was told you need a social security number and you must get it uh, by uh, the end of this week. I said, my God, in France, it would take uh, six months. Uh, it's, uh, we'll never, no, 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 no. Just go to the uh, 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 local uh, branch of the, uh, of the, of the uh, concern administration. So I go there with a colleague and what do I see? That all instructions, every instruction were written in four languages, English, Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese uh, because of certain local uh, 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 conditions. But let's restrict ourselves to, 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 to Spanish. There does exist in, 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 uh, in, in the United States a tendency, which of course these days, for the reasons that Boa and, uh, and, and Paul uh, uh, express under the pressure of uh, xenophobic uh, uh, new nationalist uh, uh, surge, are, 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 are pushed back. But there, there, there does exist a, a, a tendency, a fragile tendency towards recognition of, of, of Spanish as one of the languages of, uh, of, of, of Northern uh, America. That's a kind of federalism hope in the, if you put it even, if you, if you make it 10 times more uh, important than it actually is uh, in the direction of uh, a, a deterritorialized form of uh, uh, federalism. Sorry, I was too bad. No, no, thank you. Uh, Boaventura, do you want to go next? And also Sasha, I don't know whether you've seen it, but in the chat, Sasha has articulated his question, but, but, but please go ahead. Well, uh, um, to you, Paul, uh, the first question was uh, about this uh, messiness. Well, messiness is the ignorant uh, diversity. Is the diversity is not aware of what it entails to be diverse. 
is the idea that we have, I mean, the, the liberal idea of multiculturalism is that we tolerate differences. And the fact is very mass, messy, but who counts? What are the criteria by which uh, certain decisions are made are based on the, the you know, the, the, the major culture, the dominant culture and so on, whatever it is and how, however it is defined. So I think that what I, I, I resent in the messiness is besides this ignorant diversity, I'm for a learned uh, diversity, respectful of the real diversity. And that's where um, when at the end speaks about the diversity of languages in Europe, which is marvelous. Why don't we do the same with identity? Because then when we speak about identity, there's a closure. And, uh, you know, look at uh, Victoria, uh, Metternich in the 19th century, where the, the Austrian chancellor said, Asian, Asia begins Amlandstrasse. That is to say, Asia begin, begins at Landstrasse. The Landstrasse was the, 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 the street where the Balkanic immigrants lived there. Because for them, it was Islamic, was uh, whatever. I mean, it was Asia. I mean, this sense of defense. I was recently in Ankara and with the Turkish people that really wanted to join the European Union. And, you know, Russia is part of Europe uh, to the, the Urals. Uh, at least it was considered part of Europe. And the same with Turkey, part of Turkey, of course. Well, well, look at how long does it take for the Balkanic countries or, uh, to enter the European Union? I mean, they have been waiting and waiting. Well, what is that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is the closure of identity that sometimes is something that uh, bothers me. So I think that uh, um, against the messiness, I speak with uh, of transculturality, for instance. This is a concept that Ortiz, the Cuban sociologist, uh, developed in 1940. And in fact, a great translator from Brazil, Haroldo Campos, has also um, uh, conceive translation as transcreation. Uh, I think that when you are consciousness, are conscious of the types of diversities that you bring in, and you have to sort them out. You have to select them in a sense, but you have to select them from bottom up, out of conversation, of common purposes. And we have even to discuss the common purpose. What is the anti-capitalist? What does it mean to be anti-colonialist? What does it mean to be anti-patriarchal? I mean, all of this goes on, on the ground, even though from the top is, is, not, uh, is not visible. So it is really the idea of building uh, the consciousness of diversity and then against rel relativism. But of course, I, you know, you have to, if you are involved in liberation struggles, or if you really are on the countercurrent of something, you have to be selective. The, the old questions of critical sociology, which side are you on? There is for me objectivity has nothing to do with neutrality. Because I want to be objective, but I don't want to be neutral. I can't be, possibly, right? Even if I want. So and to be neutral in such an unequal society is to side with the oppressors very clearly. There's no other option. So as to to rather the the they are in complete. Yeah, they are incomplete. Well, there are two precisions there, rather, that we need to, if all cultures are incomplete, not, well, you know that, but you know, they are incomplete in different ways. For instance, I mentioned uh, the, the case of uh, the, the concepts of nature, for instance, and nature as Mother Earth, as uh, I think the two paradigms today are very much uh, opposed in most of the discussions. Uh, and this is much beyond, uh, you know, the social movements and organizations, whether we belong to nature or whether nature belongs to us. That, that's basically the opposition of the two different paradigms here. Well, I mean, what they are incomplete is the way in which they suppress subaltern versions of the same culture. Any culture, complex culture is very complex. So the Western culture is very complex. So we saw, for instance, basically at the same time that Descartes was developing, uh, developing nature as a res extensa, uh, Spinoza was uh, uh, discussing uh, about natura naturata and the natura naturans. And the natura naturans is very similar to the indigenous conception of the Pachamama. 
of the Mother Earth. I mean, it's, well, there are differences and I, I'm dealing with them right now, but there are very similarities. It's the idea that we belong to nature and that not nature belongs to us. So how have we suppressed that? Uh, that that uh, subaltern, you know, uh, Spinoza was excommunicated by Judaism, by Christianity, by everything. And all of a sudden, from the 19th century on, and particularly today, is being rediscovered. Why is that? Because the Europeans, in fact, uh, and I think all of us, uh, as far as I know here, can consider themselves as Europeans, if even <laughs> Francois uh, uh, is, uh, is our uh, is an European, and all, all of us, uh, she is very much uh, Europeans and the reunion person. But you know, we are rediscovering this, this culture is, is much messier in fact, because it never acknowledged this diversity from time on. And that's why I went back to Nicolas of Cusa in a sense, as a kind of showing the complexity of it, but you know, to learn from all sides. That's basically my point. So once you know, which side are you on? I mean, because the diversity of resistance is what fascinates me today. Even though I fully agree with Francois that we're in a state of permanent war, and now we are very concerned with this war because it's just more visible to us. But when we look at Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Palestine, the silence, the silence genocide that is going on in Palestine. I mean, it's it's horrible what's going on. I mean, it's the same, the hypocrisy of, of the, the infor, information war uh, under which we are currently, it could not be more, you know, more, you know, terrible now. But, you know, that's, that's the way I see. It. And I think that we have to look for these, uh, these different cultures. About spirituality, rather, of course, I mean, I know there are different conceptions. I, and uh, and uh, in the case of India, uh, nobody can hear in this group, at least like, well, I see beyond the knowledge that we have of uh, Indian culture. But, uh, you know, I've studied, well, I've been there, of course, and I've been working there. And I've said, particularly the guy that in Europe was the guy that went further in trying to show uh, for himself uh, the limits of uh, entering in a different culture. I'm speaking of Carl Jung, of course. I mean, Carl Jung is the one that goes almost to the other side of himself, as we know, where their experiences in the collective unconscious that were even dangerous for, for his uh, mental health. So to try to understand the other in India that he knew that he could not, he has a text about the limits of the Europeans while confronting the Indian spirituality. And, and finally, uh, Victoria, yeah, I think that uh, the, 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 the problem, I think it's very clear here and from what we have uh, written and uh, read from our colleagues here, uh, is that this colonial translation, most people in the world for most of their time have been forced into a translator. I mean, if you, I want to know about translation, I have to talk to the indigenous people to the Afro people, Afro descendant people in Latin America, because they are the specialists. They were the ones that were forced into translation. When we now are discussing, for instance, with indigenous movement, as I very often am, about what are the human rights? I mean, they don't have the concept of human rights in their culture. Why do they speak so much of human rights in United Nations? Because it's like English for us. Is something that they know that the white people will understand them if they speak in terms of human rights. And it's quite, uh, quite correct. I mean, I, I think that they are doing the right thing. They are doing a translation. And then uh, the boomerang effect that, that Francois has spoken is going on today in different ways. For instance, now we are learning, becoming very comfortable about the, a concept that is absolutely antinomic in Western cultures is the rights of nature. Because for us, if you really are consistent with the Cartesian concept of, of nature, nature has no rights. So rights of nature is a contradiction in adjectum, is an hybrid as I call it. It's partially a Western concept of right and nature is the indigenous concept of nature. This is the intercultural translation that we are up to. But then it is really, a kind of a counterposing to the colonial translation 
this progressive is like uh, Francois was taking Paul was referring. I mean, uh, you know, protection, colonial protection with an economy of care, a feminist conceptions of care. And for instance, in this uh, work I've been doing on the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, I didn't see any solidarity between rich and poor, but I saw lots of solidarity among the poor. The movement, the landless movement in Brazil distributed tons and tons of food to the poor communities. And it was really a marvelous way of solidarity and self-protection and self-help against the state before the abandonment of the state. So I, I think that uh, that's the point. There is one question in the chat and um, is on how penetrable are the different epistems. Uh, look, there is no name there, so I can't identify the person. It's Sasha. Uh, Sasha, oh yeah. Uh, well, there are different conceptions. I mean, it's, it's really all the complex cultures. They have uh, the porous. Uh, by, in one of my texts, very old texts already, I call the amoeba, amoeba version of the, of the culture. I mean, very much porous and open. And then there are the fortress conceptions of cultures. The fortress conceptions are impenetrable. I mean, you can't get in. And all culture have certain areas of impenetrability. For instance, the taboos, the, the silences that you never get to that. You have to respect that you, you know, translation is something in between, is an in-between space between incommensurability and transparency. Neither full transparency nor full opacity is really kind of in between. We have to, uh, what we have to do from a progressive politics is to promote the, the por poros version, the porosity of the different systems without relativism, without anything goes, which is absolutely wrong. So I think that's, that's the way, but it's a political, politically contextualized type of task. In some contexts, I think that uh, in Yugoslavia may be something, while here in Southern Europe is something else, and Eastern Europe is something else in Africa, Latin America and elsewhere. But the principle is that is look for the different versions, even with indigenous people. Because there are indigenous leaders that refuse to discuss with us. Because I don't discuss with white people. Well, they have very good reasons because in most of the time when they try to speak, the whites didn't listen to them. They, they heard them, but they didn't listen, much less deepen listening to them. But now there might be different. Sometimes they're surprised. Why are the European, the Europeans trying now to have a different attitudes vis-a-vis -vis us? I mean, it's very interesting because it's surprising after five centuries and we cannot really escape having this historical responsibility in our contacts with other cultures. And that's this complexity, bring it into your Europe. And once we bring into Europe, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very important. I fully agree with, uh, with Etienne when he says about the United States. I've lived for, well, he has lived there all, also many years. I've lived for 35 years, half, my, half, half here from August till December in Madison, Wisconsin. And I've, I've witnessed the movement of this society, of a very open, diverse society to a more, more racist, uh, on the verge of civil war, according to the majority of the population, and of course, an autocracy, a disguised autocracy, as many people say, is not Gore Vidal, it's just the people today are saying very often even in the democratic party. So societies evolve and, uh, and I think that we have to uh, understand that Europe now is living an existen existential threat. It wasn't about the first, but the Yugoslavia threat they consider though, look at German. Uh, yeah, and since you are talking about Russia, Paul, is my final topic. Let's remember Gorbachev. Yes, because yes. Gorbachev was fooled by the Americans, as he said, because NATO would never, never expand East. Because France, we have to understand France and England were against the reunion, the reunification of Germany. Who was in favor of it? Gorbachev. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Francoise, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, to your question, uh, Paul, about the protecting, I agree with you, but because effectively the way 
the question, the protection is uh, conceived is that the protector has to live by the condition that the protector imposes. So you a woman don't, if you go out at night by yourself, well, if it's happened to you, too bad. So it's also all the work that, for instance, Black feminists and others have done against innocence, you know? Either, either Black kid who was killed was innocent or did he smoke some pot or whatever, you know, all that crap. It has nothing to do with anything. You don't kill people. That's it, you know? And a woman can go out at 3 a.m. with a short skirt. That has nothing to do. So effectively, this when I'm talking about a form of protection that is anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, go back to the question of like taking care and acknowledging of weakness. And these weakness are not seen as, um, you know, uh, stigmatized. They are not stigmatized, but they are acknowledged. You know, someone is sick, is not, you're not going to treat it. So it's also a challenge what is the healthy body, how the healthy body is conceived, what is to be healthy, you know, like, and, and performative. So uh, this is extremely important to have, uh, uh, to, to, to keep in, uh, you know, to have in mind that the, that protection I'm talking about is effectively to challenge not only carceral feminism, not only the state, but also this idea that you have to be innocent to be protected. You know, that famous innocent. And that innocence is effectively constructed, created what is being innocent entail is effectively, you know, the innocent victim or whatever. And then you have the non-innocent victim, you know, for instance, as Warren Tra was saying, Palestinian kids can be killed, you know, like every day. And as if, you know, they are not children, you know, they are not, they are not innocent children. So even, you know, this question of innocence. So I agree with you. I was I wanted just to say two perhaps two or three things or so because you know um what we what Europe has to learn from uh, from you know and I was thinking that uh, in Europe itself there are a lot of people that you know uh, that Europe can, can learn from you know they just have to look at their door all the refugees all the people without papers who work in the restaurant and we clean and we speak languages that are not even recognized and they could teach you know that we could say that why is this bambara speaking person would not be able to you know to teach us bambara what we have so it's even you know how do we translate and what are the language and how do we teach these languages who will teach them and why the illegal worker you know working you washing the dishes would not be able to teach us Bambara or, or, you know, or Swahili or whatever. So for me, it's very important also to, for Europe to look at what is in Europe itself, you know, like how Europe itself has within the, the, a lot of, uh, you know, different people from you, from uh, whom uh, they, they learn to. And, uh, um, and I want to, you know, uh, you were saying also about the toxic aspect of, you know, who protect, you know, the, the big men who will protect, you know. And I was thinking of many things, for instance, you know, protests, how you organize protests, you know, who will be at the front, you know, and who will be ready to go and, you know, fight with the cops. And those who would don't feel like that or do not run very fast or do whatever and are carrying the water or or whatever or the Molotov cocktail in behind or whatever. So it's it's a question also of organization that is not hierarchical, you know, and that you you could effectively those who you know, for instance me in a protest, don't put me on the front. I don't know how to run. You know, I'm much better in the five or six row carrying the bomb or whatever we have to carry or, you know, or being with a medic. So it's also how do you organize around or so, you know, effectively some some capacity for physical force that does not become real, you know, that does not give power to this person. That's one thing. But also, effectively, what will be, uh, and also the question of self-defense, how feminists have, have also, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, I admire the Mexican feminists who are absolutely go and, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, you know, and I hope, I think that we should bring that back also in Europe because there have been something also and which is connected with the question of innocence, the question of respectability, the politics of respectability. How do you speak and will you will be listened to? Speak in a nice tone, pick, you know, like, like that pacify, pacification of, you know, and I think that rage, anger are part of, you know, uh, asking for protection also. So protection is not about being soft, cute and nice in a corner. It's also, you know, if I need to put, 
to punch you, I will punch you. You know, so it's it's really a, a question also of we're thinking. And the last things I, I wanted to say is effectively perhaps uh, it's difficult to imagine exactly what will be because we don't have really an uh, example of what the not yet, you know, the, the not yet to come. And I do think that one of the uh, very important uh, uh, thing to bring back is imagination you know, like really exercising imagination, like dare to think, dare to dare to, to believe and not in an abstract way, not, you know, what we are offered, uh, the tech, you know, the Marvel movie and the kind of super, super uh, force and super strength, but effectively from the bottom, from the weakness and from the fragility and vulnerability of life, human and non-human, we're thinking, uh, you know, imagining what will be the post- uh, racist and the post-capitalist, post-patriarchal society. And this exercise imagination are not that easy. I just want to say, you know, often I, I had a workshop, it's like imagining uh, uh, what would be a decolonial museum. And everything came like the, what um, the museum is not and how we're gonna change the museum that exists. But the possibility of imagining totally, diff you know, what would be the architecture, uh, you know, uh, even like from the bottom, from the, so it's not adding text, it's not changing the way object are shown or whatever. It's like, what is it? And perhaps it cannot be a museum. They, I mean, it has to imagine the end of the museum. So, but that question, the, this exercise in imagination that some people are doing already, but should, I think, become part of the new, uh, the international movement uh, will, will be important. And the last thing perhaps I want to say, and I think was triggered by what uh, Boaventura said at one point, it's uh, how do we imagine also, uh, how do we um, reappropriate uh, the notion of peace? Our peace is now just a short moment between two wars decided by men around the table, you know, and signing, okay, agreement for peace, but it's not peace. And peace was a revolution in demand used to be historically a revolutionary and a, femi a revolutionary feminist demand. And so, but peace has become something uh, in, with army, you know, peace army and peaceful forces. And, you know, uh, how do we uh, also uh, reappropriate peace as, a, and what is peacefulness uh, also? So uh, uh, I think it was also triggered by what Paul's saying about life is messy and effectively life is messy, but um, also, uh, in this messiness, how can we also, uh, and will be part of the politic of anti-racist protection, a certain peacefulness. Uh, and peacefulness is not uh, passivity, is not a life without asperities and, and conflict and contradiction, but the conflict and contradiction are not constantly resolved through force and domination. And so uh, we're reading, I mean, whatever, you know, Rosa Luxembourg or Clara Zetkin about peace. I mean, they're they, um, giving back, you know, like a revolution text about peace or even anti-colonial movement uh, uh, in their program. We are talking about effectively the end of war because colonialism was war, uh, daily war, daily form of war, and it's still and uh, Boaventura was very right to talk about Palestine. In Palestine, there is a daily war, there is constant war. And, and how do you imagine peace? That is not the kind of peace that state will want to impose. You know, that, you know, what is it the, when we say the end of occupation? What is the end of occupation? That is not then decided just, you know, from the top, bottom, and then that will be the border now, and you will be there. and. The, I will be there over there, but what will be effectively uh, a peaceful solution that is not the kind of uh, peace that is decided, that is still contained within the imperialist uh, vocabulary. That's where just my remarks. Excellent. Thank you. That's a good place to stop. Thanks all of the, the speakers. Thanks to everyone for the questions and the comments. Um, I'll hand back to Sanya just to just to close this to this session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was uh, it was great. It was uh, exciting, and uh, we are looking forward to hear Vero, Marinella, and Naoki in the afternoon.